and minds on uh, what the Lord has done for us as a nation. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to open our services this morning. I'm going to ask Brother John Mays if he would lead us in prayer, please. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I pray, Lord, for your blessing this day, for clear minds, open hearts, and to receive the message that you've laid upon the pastor's heart. I pray, Lord, you'll be with our country, our president, and as we strive forward, always working to serve you. And I pray, Lord, this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I read this uh, on our morning chat uh, one day this week. Uh, and I, I thought we would start our services today uh, a, a little bit differently. So I'd like to read this this morning, and then we're going to do a, a couple of other things. Uh, this is a poem, uh, America, Why I Love Her, written by John Mitchell. You ask me why I love her? Well, give me time and I'll explain. Have you seen a Kansas sunset or an Arizona rain? Have you drifted on a bayou down Louisiana way? Have you watched the cold fall drifting over San Francisco Bay? Have you heard a bobwhite calling in the Carolina pines? Or heard the bellow of a diesel in the Appalachian mines? Does the call of Niagara thrill you when you hear her waters roar? Do you look with awe and wonder at a Massachusetts shore where men who braved a hard new world first stepped on Plymouth Rock? And do you think of them when you stroll along a New York City dock? Have you seen a snowflake drifting in the Rockies way up high? Have you seen the sun come blazing down from a bright Nevada sky? Do you hail to the Columbia as she rushes to the sea Bow your head at Gettysburg in our struggle to be free. 
Have you seen the mighty Tetons? Have you watched an eagle soar? Have you seen the Mississippi roll along Missouri shore? Have you felt a chill at Michigan when on a winter's day her waters rage along the shore in a thunderous display? Does the word aloha make you warm? Do you stare in disbelief when you see the surf come roaring in at Waimea Reef? From Alaska's gold to the Everglades, from the Rio Grande to Maine, my heart cries out, my pulse runs fast at the might of her domain. You ask me why I love her? I have a million reasons why. My beautiful America, beneath God's wide, wide sky. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance. As we pledge, I, I, I want you to remember what this means. Remember, it's not something that we take lightly. There are many that have given the ultimate sacrifice that we could stand here today in freedom and love our country and respect our country and serve as God would lead us to reach this country the gospel. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to ask you to remain standing and we'll have the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, <laughs> silence reposes. What is that which the breeze on the towering steep as it fitfully blows, half concealed, half discloses? Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam in full glory reflected now shines on the stream. Tis the star-spangled banner all along may it wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country should leave us no more. Their blood has washed out their full foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. The star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace, may the heavens rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. The spangled banner in triumph shall wave for the land of the free. My prayer today that we have taken some time this weekend to in retrospect look back and remember and in all of the fervor and all of the confusion that we see today may we remember may we remember our struggle our struggle to be free. Has America always been a perfect nation? No, and she's not perfect now. But for 244 years, for 244 years, as we have listened and followed Christ, He has led us. And He'll not stop now. Oh, as a country, could we turn back to God? Oh, as a country, could we once again focus our hearts on Him? He has promised that He will respond. God, give us America. God, give us revival. God, start with us. I'm going to ask Brother Phil to come back and lead us in some more singing. You grab a hymn book. Let's lift our voices to the one who's able and willing to change America. Let's lift our voice in praise to our Savior. Let's all stand and sing, My Country, Tis of Thee.
beautiful for spacious skies.
beginning of time. Folks, it's not politics anymore. It's about right versus wrong. Right. And I don't care if you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're independent, or whatever you are. It's still right versus wrong. Right. And right will win out one day. We may have to go through a lot of wrong, but right will win out one of these days. Amen. And uh, I thought about Cain and Abel from the beginning. Right versus wrong. I thought about the children of Israel being in captivity. Right versus wrong. All the wars, the Civil War, right versus wrong. World War I, World War II, Vietnam, the Korean. Many, many men died for that flag right there. Gave their life. And for someone to tempt Trump on that and burn it, I'm going to use that word everybody uses. It offends me. When I was reading my Bible this week, I come across a piece of scripture that said, and in those days, many will be offended. Have you ever seen anything like it? Everybody's offended. I don't like this. I don't like that. Folks, it's right versus wrong. It's wrong to tear down our statues. It's wrong to riot and burn our buildings and people's lives have they give their whole life to their businesses and people destroy them. And we sit back and do nothing. It's right versus wrong. Now I don't have a, I'm an old man. I, I can't do much. But come November the 3rd, I've got one vote. And I'm going to use it. And I look at that flag and I think, uh, wow, the people that has gave their life for that flag. Don't burn one in front of me because I got a couple of pals that's going to stop you called Smith and Wesson. <laughs> so, and you know what? It's time that we, you know, sometimes you just have to meet cruelty with cruelty. And it's just time that we, we stood up and said, you know, enough's enough. Now, by the way, I approve this message. <laughs>
and the world forget the men who died who gave that right to me and are glad we stand up next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA chapter number 12. I wonder, I wonder if we love America today. <laughs> Amen. I, I think you've seen it this morning. And our hearts cry. And our hearts cry for God to bless America. And our hearts cry for God to bless America. Are we willing? Are we willing to stand and do our part? As I was preparing, and it, we've been together long enough now that you've kind of figured out that a lot of times I don't do holiday messages. I, I just... You know, I, I tried just to preach. I, you know, I'm just one of those guys who just want to preach the Bible. Yeah. The more I studied this week, the more I kept coming back to this thought. God bless America. And the more I began to just think about our heritage, and I believe the Lord laid this message on my heart on purpose for today. And I want to start off this morning by reminding you of a couple of things. There were 56 men that gathered over 240 years ago. There were 56 men that gathered together and placed their name on a document. You can go today and you can see this document that they signed. The name of the document is the Declaration of Independence. And it seems like we as a nation have, have come to a place where we take that so lightly. We've spoken of already that there's a group of folks that seem to want to rewrite our history. We want to tear down our monuments. We want to cancel our heroes. Because they don't understand. They don't understand what these 56 men did when they placed their name on that piece of paper. It wasn't something that these men did lightly. How do you know that, preacher? Well, history reveals to us what happened to these men. As they pledged, and I believe in the Declaration it talked about them pledging their lives and their fortunes. I'm just going to share a few things with you. Number one, five of the signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army and another two sons were captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. 
some specifics. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships swept from the sea by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts and died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay. And his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him and poverty was his reward. Vandals or soldiers or both looted the properties of Ellery, Claymore, Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. The Battle of Yorktown. Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. The owner quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemies jailed his wife. She died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and his gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion. sacrifice was all about. They understood what living under tyranny meant. And while they were not perfect. And while like all of us they had flaws and difficulties. They were willing to pay whatever price. For freedom's sake. As we look at our heritage, we understand that while we have a great heritage in America today, our greatest heritage didn't start 244 years ago. Our greatest heritage came from Christ. And as much as we have a call to keep our nation free, we have a call from God. And that call from God is to serve Christ that others may be eternally free. Right. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read a couple of very familiar verses. If you'd like to stand, you're welcome. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse number 2 reminds us of our legacy. Wherefore, seeing, also, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the reading of your word, for the opportunity to gather together. I pray that you'll help us not to just be patriotic today. 
And while this is a great time to be patriotic, be thankful for founders of our nation, be thankful for the freedoms that we have today, let us not forget that physical freedom is not all that there is. That while we could live free all of our lives, if we died without Christ, we will experience an eternity of bondage. Father, I pray that you'll encourage our hearts today. Yes, to stand for freedom in America. Father, I pray that our clarion call today would be not only can we be free here, but through Christ. There is eternal freedom available to all who will come to him. Help us to ring that bell today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. The simple question this morning is this, and again, I've already told you it's going to be a little different this morning. The call today is simple. The call is this, how much are we willing to pay for personal freedom? propagation of the gospel. I agree with Brother Bradshaw. Don't, you don't want to try to burn a flag in front of me. Right. I may get hurt in the process, but I will not stand by and let that happen. Amen. Yeah. But as much as we are moved by the patriotic We also must be moved by the legacy spiritually that we have been handed as well. I'm going to give you three things this morning. The first two are basically in way of introduction. And the third point will be the message this morning. We want to start first of all talking about the foundation of our faith. If we're going to stand and we're going to make a stand and we're going to say, no, there is a difference, we need to understand the foundation of our faith. The foundation of our faith is not a movement. The foundation of our faith is not an idea. The foundation of our faith is not a denomination. The foundation of our faith is a person. And we read about him in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Especially in verse number 2, where it says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We must remember that the foundation that we stand upon and the foundation that this country is built upon is the person of Jesus Christ. If we can remember our focus. It'll change the way we look at others. Because we'll look at others the way Christ looks at them. Christ doesn't see color. Christ doesn't see nationality. Christ sees sinners. Who need a, who, who need a Savior? The person of Christ sees saints. Who have repented and accepted the work that Christ did for us. So we must remember our foundation. Our foundation truly is Christ. And the power to survive and the power to live comes through not a flag. And I'm all for our flag. But that flag is a symbol. And our nation is a symbol. The power of God working through individuals who will give themselves to Christ. The foundation of our faith is in the person of Christ. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Our foundation is in the power of God working through us. The foundation of our faith is in our position. 
What is wrong with America? How many times have we said this this week? Don't, don't raise your hand give me a count. But just, how many times have we said within ourselves this week, what is wrong with these people? Tell you what's wrong with them? They need Jesus. That's what's wrong. And we look at and we look at circumstance, and we look at well, if they just were better educated, if they just understood the foundations, if they just understood the freedoms, if they could spend a week in another country. I think that would help. Wouldn't solve the problem. Because the problem is a heart problem. The problem is a character problem. The answer is our position in Christ. The answer is we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling with us, leading us to truth. The answer to the world's problems, the answer to America's problems, the answer to the church's problems is in the person of Jesus Christ. God bless America. Well, it's going to start when we as Americans come back to the foundation. And I don't mean to remind you. Because, because you and me and those of us that are saved and born again understand that when Christ found us, we weren't looking for him. He came looking for us. We look at the riots. We look at the looters. We look at those that are pulling down statues. What do you see? What do you see? So, some may say, I see ignorance. Some may say, I see rebellion. Christ see. Christ sees a sinner in need of a Savior. We look at our country. And if we were honest with ourselves, we would say there are times over the last two months that we've been disgusted with what we've seen. What's the answer? Taking the gospel to the sinner. You want to change America fundamentally? It's going to take the Holy Spirit of God and the hearts of the individual to change our country. Right. Some churches don't enjoy hearing that. Because it takes the responsibility off of government and it puts it on the church. Exactly where Christ placed the responsibility. We look at our country and we look at the way it's going. And I'm going somewhere with this. Y'all just smile. We look at our country and the way it's going. And we could sit back and we could say, look at all of that. How repulsive. How ridiculous. Or we could look at our country and break our heart. And we could say, what a need. What an opportunity. Because they are demonstrating that they need Jesus. We look at the foundation of our faith. It's Christ and him alone. As we look at the fellowship of our faith. We can spend a lot of time right here. I'm going to try to do this very, very quickly. I've got a lot of names written down here. I don't know that I'm going to get to all of them. I will just hit a few. 
When we start thinking about the fellowship of our faith, you can just turn back one page in your Bible. Maybe it's on the same page as the one that you're looking at. But in Hebrews chapter number 11, we're going to find out, and it, and it spoke of this in, chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 12, where it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The fellowship of our, of our faith starts off with, as we look at the scriptures, we can go back and we can go through the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And we can talk about some of these great men of God that came before us and, and ran the race before us. And we can talk about it. We can go through, and I didn't underline them and mark them down, but we can go through and we can talk about the Abrahams and the Moseses and the Moseses. Uh, the, those guys. And we can talk about the others that are listed here in this passage. And, and again, I didn't write them all down. Noah uh, and, and others that are listed here. Uh, how God uh, worked in their lives. And God gave them exactly what they needed. And listen, the fellowship of faith is this. Those guys went before us. They ran the race before us. They set the stage. And now we're on the stage. You can go back through the New Testament. And I, I, I printed this out and, and brought it up here. I don't know that we'll have time to look at it. Uh, but, but I brought this, printed this out of one of the Bibles that I have in my office. And it's just a list of all the disciples and what tradition says happened to all of them. And we can go through and we can see how some were beheaded and some were hung on a cross and some were burned and some were and different things and all the different things that you see through all of these disciples. So not only the Old Testament saints that are mentioned in Hebrews 11, but we see some New Testament saints in the historic record that they gave their lives for the cause of Christ that freedom might reign. We go back and we can look at some historic times as we've been going through church history and we've looked at some of these. Some of the names that we could look at were names like Polycarp and Sylvanus and Donatus and Montanus uh, and, and Novantus and, and Arnold of Priscilla and the Albin Albigenses that we talked about this morning in Sunday school. Uh, John Wycliffe and John Huss and Roger Williams and John Clark and John Bunyan and C.H. Spurgeon and D.L. Moody. And, and we can talk about all of these names of men of God that have gone before us and stood and many of them gave their lives for the cause of Christ. Will we stand for freedom? Think about what I would call current champions, the cause of Christ. Think about the John R. Wrights, Tom Malone, Lee Robertson, J. Frank Norris. I think of folks that are very special to me, Ellen Sheffield, a gentleman that I surrendered to preach under. I think about those that are still living today that I would consider great men of God. And, and I wrote down a couple, Brother Joe Arthur, Brother Johnny Pope, uh, Dan Carr Sr., but men of God that are standing today and speaking truth and preaching the word and doing what is necessary for the cause of Christ and running their race. What do we do? What do we do? foundation of our faith truly is Christ. Fellowship of our faith is a great legacy. But here's the message. What's the future? What's the future of our faith? Oh, we look at America. And I guess the, the overriding emotion and I've been through most of them. But for me, the overriding emotion that I see when I look at America today is that I am heartbroken over a nation that is so quickly turning their back. God tarries is coming for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. What's the future of our faith? Three faults. 
future of our faith. Number one is this. Our future is found in this. Number one, God is still calling men to salvation. The future of our faith is directly tied to reaching the lost with the gospel. It is directly tied with what you and I do concerning sharing the gospel message. The Bible says this in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, and take the water of life freely. I saw a video this week. I saw a video this week of a gentleman that was preaching in a, in a, in a park, in a square somewhere. And he was confronted by a young lady. And this young lady was standing there with a Bible. And she began to berate this preacher. And she began to ridicule him and say, Who are you to stand there and tell all of these people that they are lost, that they are headed for a devil's hell? Don't you understand? Don't you understand that what you are doing is you are driving these people away from Christ? Don't you understand that you are, here's the word, that you are offending them? So he asked the obvious question. So how are we supposed to reach them with the gospel? Oh, we are just supposed to live right before them. And we are just supposed to do what's right. And when they are ready, they will come to us. By show of hands, how many of us in this room, when we got ready, we saw Christ? No, Christ came seeking us. Yes, God is still calling people to salvation, but he's going to use the church of God and he's going to use you and I to take the gospel to them and not just live before them, but tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a heritage. And as much as we need to stand on truth and we need to stand on freedom and we need to Defend that flag. We need to stand and we need to defend the gospel of Christ and give that gospel to others. God's still calling folks to salvation today. Well, he's just not doing it like he used to. Wake up. He is still calling people to salvation. They need to hear the word of God. Romans chapter 10 still says, Faith cometh by watching what you do. No, that's not what it says. It says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's right. Future of our faith. God's still calling people to salvation. Number two. God is still calling. God is still calling people to ministry. God is still calling people to ministry. Preacher, I don't know how long it's been since we've seen someone from our church surrender to the gospel ministry, whether it be preaching, whether it be missions, whether it be full-time service, whether it be Sunday school, whether whatever it may be, boy, preacher, it's been a long time. That does not mean he's not calling anymore. First Timothy, chapter number one, verse number twelve. First Timothy, chapter number one, verse number twelve. Paul said, "This I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me." In the ministry. 
who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. God's still calling people today. God's still calling preachers to preach. God's still calling pastors to, to, to pastor. God's still calling missionaries to the field. Well, preacher, why hasn't God done it here? I don't know. But I know this, he's still calling. And we need to continue to preach that God's still calling. We still need to elevate the office. Used to it was an honor for a son to be called into the ministry. Now it seems like parents try to talk them out of it. Oh, I've said before, I told my son when he... When he announced his call to preach, I, you can ask him. I told him, I got him alone in a room somewhere, and I said, son, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Number one, preach if you can. Number two, quit if you can. Because if you can quit, you weren't called. And if you were called, you got preaching you. Because he put it there. He didn't understand that that day. And a few years later, he told me that. He said, Daddy, I just did not understand what you meant. He said, but I, I know now. I, I get it now. There may be somebody sitting under my, my voice today that God's been calling you. The future of our faith is at stake. Will we answer the call? Finally, number three, and I'm done. God's still calling people to salvation. God's still calling folks to ministry. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 3 tells us that God is still calling servants. Well, I'm not going to be a preacher. I don't, God's not calling me to, minister, to, to missions. Yeah, but God may be calling you to service. Matter of fact, I, I know he is. I know he's calling every one of us to some type of service for Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are written in the book of life. I wonder, I wonder why God's not saving folks like he used to. I, I, I wonder why God is not, let me rephrase that. I, I, I wonder why folks are not responding to the gospel call like they used to. I wonder. I wonder if it's because we're not surrendering to the call of servant. We'll surrender the call of being a servant. And as God opens the doors, we'll be willing to go where He wants, to do what He wants. What's the future of our faith? I'm going to close with this a couple of, a couple of questions, and then we'll have an invitation. Every church in America were just like our church. What would the state of America be if every Christian, if every Christian were Christians just like us? What kind of state? church be. Great opportunity to remember. Great opportunity to support our nation. Even better opportunity to consider the future of our faith and our part in it. Take about a
Father, we're so, so thankful for another day that you've given us. Pray that you'll help us today to be, yes, to be patriotic. Yes, to be thankful for our country. Yes, to be mindful of where we are and what we need. Father, even more than that, help us to be mindful of our heavenly home. Help us to be mindful of the calling you've placed on our life. Help us to be open and, and to you. Father, first, help us to be servants. And as we submit ourselves to be servants of Christ, pray that you'll help us to listen to that call. Pray if there's one who's out of my voice this morning that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior. That you would draw them, move in their hearts, give them the grace that they need to come to Christ today. We love you. Pray for your moving hand in our service in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Heads are bad, eyes are closed. The piano's playing. Altars are open. What's the need today? Our country's in a mess. Yes, it is. And while I am going to vote, while I do see the philosophical differences in the, the office, the answer's not in, in, in Washington. The answer's right here in this altar. The answer is right here in this book. The answer lives in our heart if we're born again. Are we willing to surrender our hearts to Christ? Here am I, send me. Father, here am I, use me. Is there one inside of my voice that's not sure if they're saved, born again on their way to heaven? It's a bad day any day to walk out of a church lost. How much more today? Christians are praying. Let God have his way this morning. So say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I hope you've had a great 4th of July weekend. It's not over yet. Still got an afternoon. I'm looking forward to all that God's going to do today. We will be back here at 5.30 for our evening prayer time, 6 o'clock for our evening worship. Vacation Bible School. We mentioned this. It's Saturday. We're going to have Vacation Bible School day. Saturday. We need, uh, we, we've got, where things are coming along. Uh, we, we've got some things planned. We're going to be finishing getting everything together. Uh, but if you are planning on being here, I think at this point we have 10 or 11 that have said they, they're, gonna, they're, they're coming. Uh, so if you can come and you can be here, please, please do so. It's going to be from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have lunch right in the middle. We're going to have crafts to do. We'll have games. We'll have skits. We'll have we're just going to do a lot of different things. We're going to have a Bible lesson. Uh, all of that, we'll be doing that Saturday, 10 to 2. All age groups are all welcome to come. Uh, just uh, plan on being with us. We're looking forward to a great time uh, in the Lord. Do remember our prayer requests that were mentioned. Continue to pray for Mr. Brody. Uh, I know they would appreciate your prayers. Uh, they're waiting on test results from all the things that he had this week. Uh, so they'll know exactly. Hopefully they'll get some good answers uh, about where they're headed. Pray for Brother Marvin Graham. He'll be going in. Uh, I believe this week for an angi angiogram, they're probably going to do at least one stint. So you pray for him. Uh, and then also do remember uh, uh, Miss Katie. She has a doctor's appointment tomorrow. She is, uh, she is miserable. Uh, don't pray for her. She just, she, uh, the sinuses, all, anyway, she's, in, she's, yeah. she's miserable. Trust me. Uh, if you want to keep her for a couple hours, you can find out. Uh, pray for Miss Christie. She's not feeling well this morning as well. So uh, do remember that. Yes, sir.
All right. Well, all good. They remember him. All right. Again, Brother Larry Cage, continue to pray for him as he recovers. Uh, tonight, we will be talking a little bit more about uh, the, the things we discussed at our business meeting. So uh, if you'll be with us tonight, we'll, we'll go over a couple of things again tonight. And, and then probably next week, we'll be making some decisions. So we'll give you all the information that we need. I don't know if we have uh, enough that we want to go ahead tonight. We may do that. But we'll, we'll kick that around a little bit more tonight. All right, let's go forward and pray dismiss our services. Again, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, what a joy it's been. We've been in the house of the Lord. Uh, we'll pray for it. Too. We'll see you tonight. Uh, Brother Phil Jacob, this is Mrs. Bush. Here comes Father.